Hello, welcome back. In this video we're going to begin to look at transmission lines. Transmission lines transmit energy and signals from one point to another, usually from a source to a load. So some examples would include like a transmitter and an antenna, or um, two computers that are networked together, or um, components in a stereo system like the amplifier and the speakers. Uh, a cable service provider and a television. The transmission line there would be a coaxial cable. Devices on a circuit board. That's another example of a transmission line. So uh, let's let's take a look, a closer look here. The idea is that the the devices to be connected are separated by distances on the order of a wavelength or much larger. So we're talking about relatively large distances and you might say well you know can I just consider this thing to just be a wire you know uh, like well, like I did in circuit analysis but previous circuit courses assume negligible length you were never told this but that's what you did and this allows us to assume that the voltage at one end of let's say a resistor is in phase with that at the other end that is there's no time delay at any point in the circuit that everything moves instantaneously. It's a it's a good approximation when you're dealing with sh relatively short lengths compared to the wavelength. However, when distances are large, we can't make that assumption that there that the the speed of EM waves is finite and that there is a non-zero time delay in your circuits. Basic circuit elements we use the word lumped, that we call them lumped, and that means that uh, we, um, we assume they introduce no appreciative time delay. Their electric effects may be considered to be lumped to a point. So if connections are long enough, we must consider the effects of these lumped circuit elements to be distributed on a per length basis. Okay, now I'm going to draw a lossless transmission line here, or at least an example of one. And in our course, we are only going to consider lossless transmission lines. So let's, let's say we have a DC voltage here and a switch. So that DC voltage gets switched in. Now this might be an external switch, or it might just be the switch to the, uh, the voltage source, right? We have, to, we have to connect it at some point. And so we've got a long transmission line, just this wire, and then we've got a load resistor, we'll call that R, or it could be an impedance as well. And I'm going to draw in blue, by the way, S, switch S2 would possibly switch in the load. Now I'm going to draw in blue this dashed line, and I'll get, get to this in a second, but I'm going to label this V+. Plus equals V0, and I'm going to draw an arrow going to the right, like that. And uh, I'm calling this a lossless line, and so what that means is that all power that's launched into the line via our source at the input eventually arrives at the output to the resistor. Okay. Now, what's happening here is that a source is connected to the input via switch S1, and we'll say at time t equals zero. At this time, the effect is to launch v plus, which is equal to v zero. Okay, so it ta again, it takes time for it to get there. Now, the, vo the voltage does not do this instantaneously. It does not instantaneously power the resistor. It takes time for the voltage source to travel. So what I'm showing here in blue is the wave front, and this is representing the boundary between the part of the line that is charged to V0, right, to the left, and the charge and the part of the line that has yet to be charged, which would be to the right of the uh, the dashed blue line there. The connection, so here here's the trick though. The connection of R to the line, well that's an interface of two different conducting media, right? The line and the resistor are potentially different media. So that means that some of the wave is going to be reflected. 
and some is transmitted into the resistor. So some of it's reflected, which means we, we're going to have a wave that comes back to the left. And actually, and we'll get there later, but those two waves could interfere with one another and um, they can constructively interfere and you can actually get voltage that's, that's larger than V0, which is uh, usually an effect that you don't want uh, on the line, but still we have to design for that case where you know we, we might not be expecting a voltage larger than our input voltage, but in fact that's what we can get uh, instantaneously. We can get a voltage that's larger than V0. So the wavefront moves at speed z, um, u. We'll, we'll keep using u for the speed. And we're going to determine that speed later. But the key to understanding the, the propagation of this wavefront is to recall that transmission lines have capacitance and inductance, which actually we've already determined using Maxwell's equations. Um, so remember, oh, well, I guess I guess I should say common types of transmission lines. So these are our friends now: the coaxial cable. Right. So here's a coaxial cable, and we're going to say that the inner conductor has radius a and the outer conductor at B. So coaxial cable, this is all conducting material here. And then in between is uh, dielectric material. And then out here, like on the surface, is another conductor. That's how a coaxial cable works. And that's the return path of the current. And we're going we're gonna to give this thing a length. We're going to call this length delta Z. Okay, that's our coaxial cable. So um, transmission lines can be coaxial, right, like cable television. And we've already found that the capacitance of such a device way back in the course is given by this thing. So you don't have to memorize that, but know that we, you should know that we've calculated this already. We've seen this coaxial cable many times. And this is the inductance of that coaxial cable. Okay, now some other types of transmission lines are what's called a, a microstrip. So a microstrip is kind of like this flat plane. So there's a conducting plane there. It's like basically an unrolled coaxial cable. There's another flat plane here. Okay, and then there's dielectric material here. And we'll call this delta Z. And this is D, and this is W, we'll say for width. So in this model of a transmission line, this is conducting material, this is conducting material, that's the return path, and then in between is dielectric material. And this is a microstrip. So these are just two common types of transmission lines. and. Uh, so you, you might see this on a circuit board, for example, a printed circuit board, and we've calculated the capacitance of this thing. Again, you don't have to memorize this, but know that we, we've done this, and the result is there for your use. And then another type of common transmission line is just the twin lead, where you've got just two wires that are parallel to one another. And we'll say that this length, the diameter is, or yeah, the diameter, excuse me, is 2a. The separation distance is d. And we'll say that this length is delta z. So this is a twin lead. And the capacitance for a twin lead, we never calculated it, but we could have. It's actually related to a hyperbolic cosine. So just know that the result exists, but don't memorize it. And the inductance is also related to a hyperbolic, inverse hyperbolic cosine, which you can find online or textbooks. And I'll let you come up with the twin lead to show, show that. Now, remember the idea is that the, the line is so long that we're not going to assume 
that we can just replace the line with just a capacitor or just an inductor, what we do is we say that the, the capacitance and the inductance is distributed along the line per length quantities. So for the coaxial cable, per length, see the delta Z is the length, so per length, and I'm going to use C hat, per length the capacitance is just this thing. We remove the delta Z because we're doing per length. Okay, and then similarly per length inductance is just mu over 2 pi times the natural log of B over A. And similarly here on a per length basis the, in, the capacitance is this and the inductance is this and here similarly We've got the hyperbolic cosine there, and on a per length. So all we're doing is just dropping the, the delta z's. We're dividing by the length, per length. Okay, and I just want to point out that some textbooks, some notation, they call this c, like they use the same c as up here, and the same l. They, they remove the hat there, and they just call that C and L, and you're supposed to know that that's on a per length basis. So I will not do that. I will use the notation C hat. So just to be clear, C hat has units of farads per meter. It's the capacitance on a per length basis. And L, L hat has units of henrys per meter, the um, inductance on a per length basis. The capacitance C, my notation is just, that's the capacitance F and L, that's the inductance H. Now, the reason we do that then is we model the transmission line like this then. So we would have our source, uh, which is not part of the transmission line. And by the way, the source could have a, an, an input, uh, a source resistance to it, um, but I'm not showing that here. So here's our switch, S1. And now we would begin to model the transmission line like this. We, we would say, OK, it has some inductance at the beginning of the line, and it has some capacitance at the beginning of the line. And then there's more inductance and more capacitance as you go through the line. right? And so we would just continue on this way until we get to really switch S2, and then the load resistor there. and so. We would say, well, how much how much inductance is this inductor? And well, that is the the per length inductance times the length of this little discrete segment that I'm partitioning the transmission line in. So these aren't actual inductors or actual capacitors. Okay, it's just that this is our model of the line then because it has capacitance and inductance. And same thing with the capacitor here. I might ask, well, how much is that capacitance? It's the per length capacitance times um, how, how much I'm splitting up the line, right? How fine, so this is delta Z, how fine am I splitting up that line? So in each one of these, if we have a uniform line, each one of these would be the same. Now this isn't truly distributed. For that, we would take the limit as delta Z goes to zero. That is, I def, def, uh, partition this line up into finer and finer segments. Um, and this, so this is the model we're going to use for the transmission line, and this also captures the situation in which R is switched in once the line has been charged. So maybe maybe the line's charged and we have yet to switch in S2. Um, now we could solve Maxwell's equations for the entire transmission line, but uh, Maxwell's equations are already actually kind of baked in to the calculation of these things. We used we use Maxwell's equations to calculate these guys. So, so they're already you know, in our model already. So actually, we're going to use circuit theory to figure out how this wave propagates, because it turns out that circuit wave, um, or circuit waves, circuit theory is going to be um, a little bit more easy for us to analyze than, than just starting from Maxwell's equations. OK, so in the next video, we're just going to continue on and we're going to calculate the wave speed and, and so forth. Okay, thank you.